Hartford Space Museum. It's September 3rd, 2009. And I'm here with Charlie E.H. And uh, you were with the 376 Bombardment Group? Yes, I was with them. Uh -huh. And what was your uh, position or uh, capacity? I was the bombardier on our crew. Your bombardier. Okay, starting. Uh, did you enlist or were you drafted in, into the well, service? That's a, that's a funny story about that. I enlisted. Uh, I was working at the time and going to summer, going to school, and I got a call to go over and get interviewed or talked to by the postmaster of my town, Cisco, Texas. And he introduced me to a, a sergeant who was recruiting, and he was at the Air Force. So he offered me the opportunity to join the Air Force, and uh, he said, if you don't join, you're going to get drafted and go crawl in the mud. Okay. So, I thought, well, that's a good idea. I think I'll join. I said, but I want to get a base close to my hometown. He says, I can arrange that. So where do you want to go? He said, I said, I'd like to go to Goodfellow Field in San Angelo. And he says, okay. And so where we go? I signed some papers. He said, well, wait for your orders. Well, I waited for about two months. My orders finally came through and I did go to San Angelo but not as a cadet, I was enlisted. I see. And uh, so I wanted to be a mechanic, because that's what I've been doing in civilian life, car mechanic. So I go to Port Sam Houston to basic training, learn how to make up a bed and do KP. And from there, I got sent back to Goodfellow Field, just like I asked for. And it says, never volunteer for anything. Well, this particular time I was assigned to the flight line and I was going through the, with the rest of the new people and here this big master sergeant said, anybody in here tight? I looked outside and it was very cold on the outside and snowy. And I said, I can. And so I stayed on the inside and became a tech water clerk and it was much warmer. Yes. And from there I got transferred to Hunter Field in Savannah, Georgia. In the meantime, I had taken my cadet exam there in San Angelo and hadn't heard from them. So when I got the good Hunter Field, I got back into the maintenance part and tech orders and all. And one day the squadron commander came by and said, here, take this list, put your name on it, and take it to the first sergeant and become promoted to sergeant. Hey, wonderful. I was going to get promoted again. Here was only a corporal. I handed him the orders to promote me, and he handed me my orders going to the cadet corps. So I never got promoted to sergeant. So from that point, uh, we went to a college training detachment at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. And there we studied 180 hours of physics. We had math, English, and geography, and you name it. It was all taught to us by Jesuits, and they were very sharp people, very good instructors. Now, what, what time frame is this? Time frame is in uh, 1943. 43. Uh -huh. okay. And I spent uh, all that time in Cincinnati, which was wonderful. Then I went to classification at uh, Hunter, at not Hunter Field, but the Kiesler Field, and they interviewed you. And I wanted to be a pilot, very bad, because I had my private pilot's license. Oh, so you learned to fly where you were a civilian? Uh-huh. Okay. And I had my license already. So I naturally wanted to be a pilot. So we go to get uh, examined and take our physicals and mental exams and get interviewed. And the next thing you know, we said, well, we're sorry, but we're loaded with pilots. So you're going to have to take a choice. You want to be a navigator or a bombardier? I said, I want to be a bombardier. So that's when I went through Ellington, the pre-flight, and then back to San Angelo, Texas again for bombardier training. And that uh, put me close to home again. Now, is that, when you, did they, is that where you learned how to use the Norton bomb site? That's where we learned to use the Norton bomb site. It was rather new to the Air Force at the time. And we had to guard it and take precautions that it didn't get into the loose in the public. Now, I've heard stories that bombardiers had to carry a sidearm. Well, we did. Protect yes, the bomb uh -huh. site. And uh, so we used the Norton bomb site. Once in a while, we'd use the, the other bomb site, which is clumsy, but the Norton bomb site was really good and accurate. What kind of plane did, did you use when you were doing the bomber we were training? AT-11. AT-11. Uh -huh. 
Uh-huh. And when did you, how or when did you form up with the crew? Uh, we went to Westover Field in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. And after graduating from uh, Bombardier School, and there we formed up with our crew. Both officers and enlisted? Yes, both officers enlisted. And who was, the, who was your pilot? My pilot was named Bob Pelsman. He's from New York City. He was about 19 years old, and so was I. We were all very young. Okay. And our oldest member of the crew was 26, and he was the only married one. He, he was, was the, the old man, guy. huh? Yeah. So how long did the, how long did you go through crew training? Uh, oh, I'd say four weeks at the most. Okay. And out of Charleston. So you farmed up in Massachusetts, but went down to went South. down to Charleston and got our combat crew training. Okay. On air flew training missions, bombing missions, and an airplane approaches and getting everybody used to the airplane. So you were already in B-24s at the yes, time. Yes, at that time. Uh -huh. Okay. And from Charleston, we went to Meacham Field. And we were going to fly an airplane over to Europe, I presume. We didn't know where we were going. So you could have gone to the Pacific. You didn't know. Yeah, we didn't know. And uh, we, up at uh, the Mitchell Field, we would check out our equipment and go out to the airplane. Or you're not going today, and turn it back in and check it back out. This went on for a few days and a couple of weeks, just about finally. We got the airplane, it was a brand new B-24 M model. M, is it Mary? Yeah. Okay. And it was made by the Ford Motor Company. I've heard there were some people who were thinking that an automobile manufacturer could make airplanes. Well, he did. And he did? It was a good airplane. Uh, I got up in the nose and looked into the map case and here was a note in there about a person who had worked on the airplane. And so I got the address and when we got overseas, I wrote to this person, it had to be a girl, and she sent me her picture. I don't see how she got the nose of the airplane. She's kind of big. But anyway, I let her know where her airplane was, and it in, had it in Italy then. But you maintain contact with this person? Uh, once or twice I did, and that was the end of That's it. Uh -huh. So did you, you flew a plane o over to We overseas. flew a plane over. We went from uh, Mitchum Field to Bangor, Maine, stayed there to get the weather okay and went to Greenland and from Greenland to the Azores, Azores to Marrakech and Marrakech to Barry, Italy, where we turned the airplane over and we never saw it after that. Never saw it. Huh? Uh, did, was there, did you guys give that plane a name? No, we didn't. No, you didn't? Uh, no. But we stayed as a crew intact all that time. So how did you when you arrived at Barry, is that when you found out you were going to the 376? Yes, that's when we found out and they trucked us down there in six buys and we wound up at the 376 bomb group and they put us in our squadrons. I was in the 514th. And what, what time for, what part time, when was that? When did you arrive at the uh, at, uh, that San was Pan? In, uh, kind of late September of 44. September? Uh-huh. And when did you fly your first mission? Uh, I flew my first mission. I'm looking at a book that I have here. It was on 11 4 44. We went to Blue Spear Bomb, Italy. So it took about a month between the time you arrived and you flew, flew so, your first mission. And then when we flew the mission, uh, you would fly with an experienced crew so that you could get used to combat training with an experienced crew. Okay. And that crew may have had three or four missions itself. I see. And so when did you, when did the Pelsman crew fly its first mission? As a, as a uh, well, we flew, we flew about uh, three missions with an experienced crew, and then we went to our own flying with our own crew. And then did you do the same thing? Did you then indoctrinate new crews? Uh, uh, yes, we did. We'd take a new crews with us and uh, orient them and give them the, the cook's tour. So I, to speak. I see. And so how many, did you, were you there in April when the, when the group ended? Yes, or? it was. Uh -huh. Did you go to another group then? Yes, we went to the 461st bomb group up at Poggi, Cherigno, Italy. And how many missions did you fly with them? Well, actually I flew one mission with them as a crew. It wasn't our crew, it was a mixed crew. Okay. And uh, the best mission we had out of that group, I thought was the war ended and we were dropping supplies to the prisoner of war camps, K rations and and uh, blankets. Oh, to the fly to low level over them and drop them out. To your fellow allies. Uh -huh. to the, I see. Was this in over Germany? Or yes, over uh -huh. Germany. Yeah, okay. we took the ground crew with us so they could see where they did bombing. 
Uh, okay. So, um, back to the 376, is there a particular mission that stands out? Either it's good, bad, or different? It could be well, there are a couple of missions that stand out pretty much. One, we flew on Christmas Day, December uh -huh. the 25th, to Innsbruck, Austria. It was a marshaling yard target. And uh, we got into pretty much heavy flak at that time, and we lost four, two engines out of the four and our bombs did not release, and we were sinking rapidly, and I salvoed them through the Bombay doors, and uh, the airplane just kind of lifted up like that, and we were on one side of the Alps, and we had to dump all of our guns, black, black suits, and heavy stuff, just so we could lighten the weight of the airplane, because we only had one and a half engines left. Wow, did you make it back to the base? Did well, we all wanted, voted to go to Switzerland. Oh. <laughs> Or get in turn there. I see. And my pilot says, Well, you've got nine votes and I've got ten. ten. <laughs> We're going back home. I see. And so over the Alps we went and slowly losing altitude. And we landed, we lost the left landing gear. And uh, it was been hit by black and lost the hydraulic. So you did make it back to San Fan? You didn't make it just back to San Fan. Uh -huh. Well, it does sound like a pretty normal voyage. It was. We all wondered what happened to our machine guns and flak suits that we flew out. So they were somewhere either over the Alps or they were somewhere over the Alps. Or, yeah. or the ABA. And the next one was the day right after that, the 26th. On the 26th of December. We were flying Deputy Lee. My pilot always volunteered to fly his mission so we could get him over with. And we flew lead about 13 or 14 times. This particular mission, we were deputy lead. That means we were flying in the slot underneath the lead airplane. The number two slot or the number three? Well, it was actually about number one, two, three, four, four. by number four slot. So, so you were we down were, behind and below? We were below and behind the lead plane. Okay. And uh, you would synchronize as the deputy lead, you would synchronize in case something happened to the lead plane. Well, I'm looking out and watching the lead plane, and the next thing I see is a big ball of fire. And he had a direct hit by flak and blew up right in front of us. And we flew through the debris of his airplane. Luckily, we didn't get hit by that by the debris. And I went ahead and synchronized, and we dropped the bombs on this bridge. And would you believe it? It got a direct hit. On the bridge? Uh-huh. Wow. So you took the bridge out. We took the bridge out. And the striking thing about that in the year 2000, my wife and I went over to go to the Amish uh, shows they had down there over 10 years, uh -huh. the religious show. And we were on a tour and we went across that same bridge in the Breder Pass. Wow. Interesting. It was. Um, so when the plane, after the plane, you said the lead plane blew up, did you actually then fly up and take the lead position? Well, yes, we assumed the lead position and my pilot took over and we led the, the formation back to the base. Uh -huh. So that was, the, the, you say deputy, was a deputy leader of the whole 376? Oh, the, that squadron. Oh, that squadron. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we had a six ship formation for each squadron. And you were also telling me before we started this that you flew, uh, what were called, I guess, lone wolf missions, where you went just by yourself? Yes, we had, uh, my pilot volunteered for us to fly these lone wolf missions. <laughs> and uh, they were scheduled by regulation. You took off at night, and you never got out of the clouds. If you did, you're supposed to abort the mission. <clears throat> well, gee, after you go so far, you feel bad about aborting when you can keep on going. Yeah. So we kept on going, and then the bright moonlight and the bomb, moose beer bomb, a couple of times like that. That's an oil refinery. Right. What What was the supposed advantage of sending only one plane as opposed to a group of? Oh, well, just a sneak planes. attack, so to speak. And we our Keep plane, away. our plane was painted gray, so it would not reflect uh, floodlights and all. I see. And a specially designed airplane. We had radar in it. Our seventh they had radar. Were these ones that would be called RCM airplanes? Radio control? No. Uh, were, they, were they Pathfinder planes? Well, roughly a Pathfinder, you might call it. Yeah. Okay. So you'd go out at night and go out at night? night? Yeah. And the radar operator was in their waste compartment of the airplane. 
and we oh, he was in the back. Uh -huh. Okay. And he had his scope back there, and we coordinated the bomb run in that respect. He would give us a heading and what we're supposed to be doing, and I would synchronize on the on the spot, and we drop our bombs that way. Now, normally, I mean, when you hit the IP, the bombardier takes over control of the plane, correct? Yes. Uh -huh. So when you're on these lone wolf with this pet fight, who was it? You or the radar operator who had control? Well, you of the kept plane? control of the airplane because you had second station, okay, and you had the autopilot tied into the bomb site, okay. And every time you made a heading correction, it would correct the airplane. I see. For course corrections. Okay. Um, what was it, what would you say you're successful at the flying? Could you see you, you hit something? I should say we were successful because following the bomb run, we would see uh, several fires that were left behind us. And so these were at the oil refinery? Yes, active yeah. oil refinery. Uh -huh. And then you fly back to 10 pan and go back, to sleep? Yeah, fly back home and go to sleep. Yeah. So when they first said, hey, you're going to fly out at night, did you look at each other going, what? I mean, well, we kind of. Wonder what it was going to be like, and uh, we'd never done it before. But we went ahead and trusted our pilot to go with it, and we did. We had a good pilot, I thought. You were saying earlier that Pelsman volunteered to get the main mission is to get it over with as quick as possible. Yes, yeah, so he wanted to get back home and get married. He met a, oh, I see. Yeah, he he had met a reason. girl in Charleston, and he wanted to get back home and get married to her. Did he marry her? Yes, he did. Okay. <laughs> he Interesting. married her. And, he may remain in the airport and retired out of Travis Air Base I in see. California. When the uh, when you said at the end you went to the 461st, was the, the whole crew then went to the 461st? Uh, he didn't, but oh, he the, did the rest of the crew did. Yes. Uh -huh. He he was already through. He was already home. I see. Yeah. Okay. So um, after VE day, what 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 did you do? Well, we flew an airplane home. Okay. And we went. Kind of reverse course by going over there, except from Marrakech, we went to Dakar, Africa, and then across to Buenos Aires, and up that way to Charleston Air Base, and left the airplane there. Uh -huh. What happened to it, I don't know. I was in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, when VE Day hit, uh -huh. and we were getting ready to go to B 29s to go to the Pacific, and VJ Day hit. I see. So we didn't have to do any of that. So, but you were learning to fly 29. We hadn't gone to 29. Oh, you had not gotten No, there. we had not gone to it, no. Okay. And following that, while we were in uh, Kansas, uh, Grand Isle for a while, and I got orders to go back to Germany to the Air Force Army of Occupation Forces. Oh. Okay. And so I went by ship over there, and we landed at Bremerhaven. I didn't know where I was going. I wound up. North, south of Munich and north of Garmisch at a rest camp, and uh, I became a adjutant and a historical officer and air policeman and everything else in that particular job. And uh, we had 16 hotels, and we had the Air Force people coming in for R and R there and supported them. Hmm. That was a pretty good assignment. Sounds like it. How long were you there? I was there for a year, and. Uh, I came home so I could get out and enlist as a chief master sergeant or a master sergeant at that time because they were going to start taking your commission away from you. But when I got home, instead of doing that, I went to Texas Tech and enlisted or stayed out there until I got recalled to active duty in the reserves from uh, Reese Air Force Base. And uh, from there, I went to Sacramento, Mather, and taught bombardier training, and this was during the Korean conflict. And then I stayed in, and from there I went to Harlingen Air Base, where I instructed in navigation school and bombardier school. And then I went to recall back to, uh, I was still on active duty, but I was reassigned to uh, France at that time. And it went to B 57s in Lone, France. For Canberra? And Canberras, uh huh. Include Canberras. And from there, I got assignment to SAC, Strategic Air Command, in Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, where we flew B 52s. And we took in B 52s. I got a little over 5,000 hours in the 52s now. And we went to Vietnam. We were the first B 52 bunch to bomb Vietnam. 
We were flying out of Guam. We were flying out of uh, Marshall Air Force Base uh, over to Guam oh. and then flying out of Guam. Guam. Yes. Uh -huh. So back to right after the war. So you said you uh, went to Germany for a while. You came back home and you, and you enrolled in Texas Tech. Now were you were you active or were you on? I was in reserve. reserve. You were Texas in reserve. Tech, uh -huh. When you went to Texas Tech on the GI Bill? Yes, I did. And what did you study? I was studying uh, geology and general uh, science. And did you graduate? No, I didn't. I got a recall before I graduated. I was there for four years, but I got recalled to active duty. This is because of the Korean conflict? Korean conflict, uh-huh. Okay. And that's where I got married out there and met my wife. Oh, when you were at Texas Tech? Uh -huh. oh, I see. So you were about to graduate or you were in your senior year or whatever? I was in my senior year and I got recalled and uh, went back to the Air Force. There I stayed in and I got a total of 34 years in the Air Force. So you just made the Air Force your career? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. Did you ever get back to Texas Tech? And yes, I did. Up? Did you? Uh -huh. well, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. So you would, um, you stayed in the Air Force and you said you finally went, you became a uh, B-52? Uh, what bombardier? Bombardier and navigator in B fifty two, huh? And you went you went over to Guam and went over to Guam and Okinawa and Yuba or Bangkok rather. <clears throat> okay. Huda Powell we call it. So comparing a bombing mission over Vietnam and a bombing mission over southern Europe, which was more challenging, there's, shall we say. There's no comparison really. Okay. We didn't have the flak that we had over in in Europe. Uh-huh. Over in Europe, you look like you can walk on it. I see. We didn't have so much over in Vietnam. We had to watch out for the service air missiles, though. Uh-huh. And uh, watch them very closely. But a strange thing is uh, my son was in OB-10s flying forward air control at the same time in Vietnam as I was over in B-52s there. So we were both there at the same time. But he was much closer to the ground. Yes, he was. Uh, he was. Was the OB-10 the air, forward air controller? He was a forward air controller. Uh, he'd, he'd spot targets and call in for... So he, would he call your group in? No, he'd, he'd call the fighters in. So the F-4s and the and that, F4s the Navy bunch, uh -huh. Okay. And so when did you retire from the Air Force? I retired in 76. Okay. And my wife got me to go to work for American Airlines at the time, and I went to work for American Airlines and in their scheduling section and stayed there for 14 years, retired from there. I see. So I'm just completely retarded. Completely retarded, I it see. Is. Now, early on, you mentioned that you already had a pilot's license before you yes, were, I did. were drafted or enlisted, whatever. Did you ever fly military, probably for the military? No, I didn't fly a military airplane, no. Did you, did you resume flying civilian planes? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. But the military saw no need for you to... Yeah, they were full of their pilots. Yeah. They were full of your pilots. Okay. Yeah, I left a space open for my son to be there. Oh, I, I see. Did your son still, still fly? Uh, my son uh, retired from the Air Force and went to work for Delta and fled for, for retired from Delta. Wow. So aviation is in the, the gene in pool. The I guess you might say because my birthday was on the 17th of December. And that is the same day that Orbra and Wilbur Wright did their first flight. First flight. Uh -huh. Of course, a few years ahead of me. Uh huh. But still, uh, I was destined to be in the Air Force. Okay. Now, you mentioned that Pelsman uh, didn't keep up with your. I mean, he finished early and I assume went home. Yes, he did. But the rest of the crew stayed as a group? The rest of the crew stayed as a group. And uh, at, the, at this point in time, there's only two of us from the crew left alive. I was the name of Brocklehurst, who was the ball gurner, and myself. All the rest of passed on. And did you maintain contact with each other? Yes, we did. Uh -huh. We met at uh, reunions a couple of times, and most of them didn't go to the reunions, but uh, it's too expensive. But that's how we kept in contact, and by phone and letters at times. That was, that was nice. My dad never kept up with his crew, so I never knew anything about him. Uh -huh. We did, and still don't have them left. They're all gone, just about, as I said. But, so, but you maintained Brocklehurst, I think you said it? Yes, he, was he, lives in, he lives in Michigan. Michigan, uh -huh. I see. Well, we had a reunion lately in Milwaukee. But, well, uh, he didn't get to go to that, though, and I didn't either. Well, that's right, you didn't go there either. No. 
that the old health problem got to me. Ah, okay. Well, I'm glad you made it to this one so we could. Well, we I could have to. It's probably my last one. If I don't get any better, it might be my last one. Well, I sure hope to see you at Albuquerque. Uh, is there any particular mission or camp life or uh, experience that you humorous or was, did you remember or stands out? Uh, you were telling me about, for example, ping pong tournaments that you guys used to play. Well, yeah, Al House, Al Heist and I used to play ping pong over in San Francisco, and we became quite good at it. I see. It was hard to beat. I see. One of those, the winner keeps playing until they yeah, get beaten. That's right. Uh, Al lived in a tent next to me, uh -huh. and uh, that's how we got together. I see. Now, did the, the, the crew, the officers, stay in the same tent together? Yes, we did. Uh, we had our same tent, and this is where the next tent. In the next tent. Uh -huh. okay. So, uh, how did you find out when you were going to fly a mission? Oh, we'd go down to the uh, officers' club or the orderly room, and we'd see a sign up on the wall, or that we were going to fly, and that we were scheduled to fly. That's how we found out. Plus, our pot would come by and tell us. So would they list like Pelsman, and then it was just assumed you flew with them, or did oh, they yeah. actually have the list of the nine other men? No, it had Pelsman's crew, and we knew who we were. So, uh, how would you, for example, you were saying earlier that there would be new crews would be in, be integrated in for a few missions. So, how would you find out that oh, we're not going to have our normal co-pilot today? We're going to have another. Well, they'd be on the list. Be on the list. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, they'd meet you at the briefing uh, that came about, and we made a trip back over to our old base in San Pancrazio, and uh, a group of us, and that was sort of a reunion party. We were all in the same bus, and uh, in San Pancrazio, we went out to the base. While the town was getting ready for us, we surprised them that we were coming in. Well. We went to the base and went up down the runway, which is all made with the uh, PSP, they call it. The Germans made the runway to begin with. And then we went around to where uh, headquarters used to be, and that was the only building standing. We couldn't even find our, our squadron area. Hmm. But we did find the, the barn that uh, they used to brief in and now had hay in it. I see. And, uh, is it still being used as an airfield, or is it just no? Uh, it was flood? usable as an airfield, yes, but I don't think it was uh, done continuously. It was just it was just there if you wanted to use it. At the beginning of the movie, uh, Twelve O'clock High, it begins with somebody describing going back to the airfield, and he's yeah. standing. Is, was it like that? Is yes, it, it was. Uh huh. Uh, very much. We uh, were there on around the fifth of July, which was commendable with the 4th of July as such, and we planted flags at the end of the runway. Uh -huh. And uh, looked at the vineyards, uh, the grape vineyards that they had there, and the olive trees, and a lot of olive trees. And then we went into town that day, and the whole town turned out for us. And as we got off the base, an old gentleman came up to us and says, I remember you, I cut your hair. And another little, guy came up to us, he wasn't little anymore, he said, you don't remember me, but you caught me stealing at your barrack, at your tent, and instead of turning me in, you gave me food, and I was real proud of you. Did you remember him? Yes, we can remember that incident, and we didn't want to turn the kid in, he needed the, the goodies, and uh, let him go, and he gave Turned out to be a pretty good friend of ours. Well, it sounds like this reunion was very uh, emotional. I mean, it was yeah, a there was only about 20 of us there, and uh, the mayor met us, and they turned their little band out and got in the center of the of the town square and got us on the stage and gave us a plaque welcome us to San Francisco. It was quite uh, quite a quite wonderful a, thing. Yeah. So they must have been very happy to see you come back. They were. Now, what, what was it like when you were actually there then in 44, 45? Did you have that same relationship with the town folks? Uh, not really. We, they didn't bother us. They, we mingled with them with some, but we didn't get friendly with them. Uh, maybe some might have found a girlfriend they liked and 
uh, went out with them. But other than that, uh, we didn't really mingle with them that much. I've heard people talk about going out on nights, whatever. To R I don't want to call it R and R because it was maybe a day trip or a night trip. But I, you always talk about going to Lychee or the Fuji, but I don't hear many people talk about going to San Pan. Well, San Pan was uh, just not too far out of town. Just a white spot in the road, so to speak? No, it's a pretty good sized little bird. Okay. And a uh, village there. But then they had a mayor and a police force and all of that. Yes, they did. Uh, but we'd go to Lechi because it was a bigger town. Bigger town. More to do. Uh huh. Then we'd go to Barry once in a while, which where 15th Air Force headquarters was located. And it was uh, kind of like going from. Uh, Dallas Fort Worth to New York City. Mm. That size of changes the size wow. of the town. I've also heard that you guys had a beach, is that right? Uh, or was it was it like a 15th Air Force beach? No, I don't recall the beach. Well, maybe I'm misremembering. No. Uh, okay. Well, we didn't have any special place like that. There were always rumors of the Italian sabotaging. Was it? Do you recall any type of incidents like that? No, the, the sabotage wasn't really sabotage so much as it was a theft. Theft? Taking stuff, food, and, and things that they might could use in civilian life. Uh, now, we did have a case of sabotage at the base one time where they caught a sergeant who had wired the gear mechanism up to a bomb. And as soon as the gear had come up, well, the bomb would explode. And that happened once or twice. So this was an American? Uh-huh. Wow. And we lost an airplane, a couple of it, I remember, on takeoff that way, until they found out what was going on. Hmm. That's kind of sad. Well, did you ever get the impression, did you think the, was it the Italians glad you, the Americans were there? Or were... I think they liked us, yes, because we saved them from the Germans that they didn't like, and the Germans uh, just ruled the roost with them, and we didn't do that. Wow. We were very kind to them. Okay. And we took over their airfield and their area and infiltrated their town, and they liked that because they made some money out of us. I see. That was, that was Cutting hair and, and yeah, that kind of stuff. They liked it that way. I, re I remember seeing pictures of. Um, of the IDs, is that what you call them? ID? Was your, what was your nickname for the Italians? ITIs. ITIs, okay. Uh, them doing a lot of the manual labor around the camp, building. I'm sure that, yes, they used the Italian uh, labor quite a bit. Now, one of the other unusual things is when we go eat breakfast, once in a while they would have eggs. Yes. And there'd be fresh eggs. That was very seldom. And you had to sign a roster to get to the egg. Uh, and there you go through, you see somebody would sign Adolf Mussolini or <laughs> Hitler to get the aid. I see. That's how we got our eggs. I see. But that was a real treat. Yes, it was a real treat. Was there any other food item that was a real treat? Oh, the wine they had. We get a lot of wine from them. Oh, from the Italian, from the ID. Italians, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I see. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, our, we had a BX in town that. Uh, it was a small place, but it was a, a BX, as we call it. Uh -huh. You could go in and get things there, and they're all rationed. And uh, one of my gunners, the engineer, fell for this one Italian girl, and she invited him out to dinner. So I was telling you about that, and it, we, we, he didn't want to go by himself, so he asked me if I'd go with him. So we went to their little toothy hut, we called it made out of toothy brick, and that uh, was a rock that they used over there. That was where you could carve on it and make mold it and make it into certain forms and make uh -huh. a house out of it. Yeah. We went to their house, and here the big mamacito was making dough and dripping it up to make spaghetti. And here the pet cat came crawling up on the table, walking around where the dough was. She said, "Shoot, shoot." Via, via. And right then I didn't, I was not hungry anymore. But he had to eat with him. Yeah. But he had your. He had to eat, yeah. Well, you had a girlfriend there. Yeah, that's right. So that was just a, one occasion that I can remember. Uh huh. 
with the Italians. Did your crew ever go on R and R when you were over there? Oh, uh, that's another story. Uh, we came back, and my pilot enjoyed buzzing the squadron area, and we buzzed so low one time that number four prop got the stove pipe out of the mess hall kits. That must have been somebody happy. And nobody knew who it was that did the buzz until the crew chief found the, the nick in the prop and he knew who was flying the airplane. Well, by that time, the squadron commander felt that our crew needed R&R. &R. We had combat fatigue. So he came around and sent us to Capri, except he said, I can't go to Capri. I was flying the next day. So I had to fly with another crew the next day. And when I landed, he says, well, you can go to Capri or you can go to uh, Rome, which you want to do. I said, I'll take Rome. So I went to Rome for R&R. &R. And while I was in Rome, would you believe it? The man that was in our best man in our wedding came down the street. He just lived a little few doors from me in my hometown. Yeah. So he was over there. He was flying P-47s. Oh. And I ran into him in Rome. So in Rome, I went to the Vatican and went to all those places that you like to see and enjoyed it. Ah, okay. So I went to Rome instead of Capri. Later on, we went back. Uh, when we went back to Italy, we all went to Capri this time. So did the did the squadron commander ever find out that who had buzzed the? Uh... <coughs> Yes, the and yes, they found so out. Yeah, that's why he sent us an R and R. Oh, that's why he sent yeah. to an R. I see. Yeah. He decided that Pelsman was uh -huh. a little, little loose, huh? Yeah. I yeah. see. A little loose. So it was a good bus job. <laughs> it wasn't pretty low if you took out the uh, smokestack. It did. It. I see. Yeah, I, be I believe uh, that was a frowned on maneuver was the bus. It wasn't appreciated to be buzzing the camp. It was, no. Now, who was your squadron commander? You know, I don't know. I see. Okay. I didn't get up to care about it. Oh, okay. It didn't bother me. Who was the group commander? Uh, is it Graf? Graf. Graf. Colonel Graf. I best I remember there, yeah. What did you think of Graf? I liked him. He, everybody liked Colonel Graf. He had a big mustache and <laughs> uh, was a friendly guy. He, he went on with missions, too. Yes, he, he did. Uh huh. He was a very good commander, we thought. I see. Okay. Well, we're starting to run out of time. Is there anything you'd like to add that I haven't asked about? Or? Well, the 376 has been a, quite a notch in my life. It's been a trademark of mine and I like, and a bunch of good people in it, a bunch of dedicated people. And we've stayed together for a long time. There's still a lot of them out there that are members that we wish it would come to a reunion. And why they don't? Well, there are a lot of reasons, I'm sure. Money has, might have a fact, and now it's health, because all the people that were over there are up in their 80s now. Right. And so that uh, cuts down their attendance quite a bit. Now, you were a, were a president of the association, right? Yeah, I was president of one time. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. We had two reunions. One was in, uh, what? not Cincinnati. Coming to Covington, Kentucky, which was they crossed the river from Cincy, and the other was in San Antonio. Uh -huh. Well, uh, if there's nothing else, I thank you very much for your service, and thank you for taking the time to uh, talk with us today. And well, Ed, thank you for your dedication and your efforts. Well, it's been my pleasure. So really good, good luck, sir. You bet. Okay.